Will, thank you very much for coming. You're doing a PhD in philosophy at Hogang University, and you're focusing on Korean Taoism. This is a very different subject from the things that we've done recently. So let's start with something, Will, that's perhaps very simple, but at the same time, incredibly difficult. Taoism. What right. is Taoism, please? Yeah, I'd like that you point <laughs> out the difficulty in that. It's it's often the like seemingly simple questions that are actually difficult to pin down. Um, Taoism. Uh, it's a tradition, indigenous tradition from China. Mm. That's where it originated, and then it spread to Korea and a little in Vietnam, a little in Japan. Um, but largely, it's known as being a kind of Chinese phenomenon, largely. Mm. Um, yeah, and it's <laughs> very, uh, right, so came originated from originally um, Chinese shamanistic kind of roots um, way back, like, um, and that's where we uh, see symbols such as um, Tai Chi or uh, Tao mm. originally is in like uh, Shang Dynasty, uh, like bones. Um, you know, they would throw these like a shoulder bone of an ox into a fire and then it would crack in various ways. And then the shaman would kind of divine like the king's future or something like that out of the various cracks. Um and yeah, so and also I guess they use them as a sort of like writing medium, and so they um, carved in various characters and things like that into the into these bones, and that's like kind of the origin also of like Chinese the Chinese writing system is what we, what we can find is the earliest things are these bones, yeah. Mm. Um, yeah, Taoism. I mean, it's um, yeah, so it has extremely ancient roots, um, and it's. Uh, difficult to point down like a specific date of like when something called Taoism emerged. Um, although uh, most people, I guess, would do that in the way of like their texts. So like the Lao Tzu and the Zhuangzi, which we'll talk about later, um, written roughly fourth century BCE. And that's kind of, that's, I guess, a good start of like where most people would say Taoism began. Yeah. You know? mm. Um, and then from there, it's evolved, especially in like the second century CE. Um, it evolved into kind of what we can call like a religious Taoism. And so um, then onwards, yeah, after that, came to Korea um, officially in sixth century CE. Um, but I, <laughs> I believe it came a little earlier than that, mm. um, maybe by as much as a couple centuries. And um yeah, I mean, yeah, that's that's. Can you say anything more about the bones, Will? I mean, I've heard of the bone rank system in the Schiller. I've heard of divining tea leaves and telling future through that. I've never heard about this. Is my ignorance throwing bones into a fire? Mm -hmm. um, yes, uh, I can talk a little bit about that. Um, so yeah, as I said, they these kind of shamanistic people mm. um, who were. Yeah, supported by the king or any other, you know, kind of anyone who would pay them, I suppose, mm. um, for dividing their future um, or perhaps like forecasting the results of a battle, mm. something like that. Um, so, yeah, they would often take usually a shoulder. The famous one is like a shoulder blade of uh, an ox or um, a tortoise shell also. Um, you can see, yeah, they use the, these two uh bones in particular is like a yeah medium for that kind of work um mm. and yeah so i mean yeah i mean people, that that's people like don't still do that do they is it does any of that practice left remaining we still have shamans right is there anybody still throwing tortoise shells into fire uh i not as far as i know mm. uh which i mean maybe thankfully right <laughs> this poor, <laughs> poor tortoises yeah <laughs> Uh, but um, I don't believe it's a living tradition, uh, that aspect of it. But, um, yeah, I mean, you can, like, Google pictures online and you can see, like, various, yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's kind of, like, really the roots of the Chinese writing system is can be found in those. Uh, where does the writing come into it? So they would uh, they would inscribe things onto the bones or that there would be a message appearing on the bones? or Yeah, I guess I believe... Um, yeah, I guess they would do both. So okay. they would use it both for just 
putting it in the fire for a while and seeing the cracks and then like interpreting the different cracks and as to like you know maybe one crack or look kind of like a victory mm. kind of character or something mm. like that and um yeah uh, or and then also yeah i'm not sh- i'm not i'm not exactly yeah, sure about yeah. this um but it seems like i mean i've seen images and it there's bones that are seemingly intact maybe not burnt mm. and they would just use that you know as maybe one would have like a stone tablet or something and you know, kind of carved in uh, okay. various characters. Yeah. Is this? Have you heard about bones in fire to tell the future? Is this? Does this come in Korean history? Or? Um, I just heard of the like turtle bones with like text is um writing yeah. thing. Um, as I believe it is called kapgolmun. When I learned it in my high school, mm. I'm not very pl- proud to talk about it in front of like <laughs> professional people. But <laughs> yeah, I think I remember it. No, this is great because you guys, I've never heard of this before. I've oh. never heard it. I'm going to go and watch Kung Fu Panda all over it <laughs> and, and get a different vibe from it. Yeah, mm-hmm. but I, I've never heard of like throwing like shoulder bones into like fire. That's so interesting. Yeah, I agree. Can you give us maybe a little bit of what Taoism is? So you gave us some of the historical background, its origins from shamanism, um, 4th century BCE. What is Taoism? What does it suggest? Or what are some of its key concepts, maybe, to help us understand it? Right. Uh, so it's uh, the label Taoism is kind of a later uh, name given to this kind of phenomenon mm. that was occurring in China. Um, so figure a figure such as Lao Tzu or Zhuangzi, they did not self-identify as being Taoist. Mm. Um, that label didn't exist at the time. Um, but... Yeah, so I mean the you know in Taoism the big thing is Tao or Do in Korean. Um, that's seen as you know it's tr- been translated a m- number of ways uh, mm-hmm. such as way, uh, path, etc. Um, and it's sort of the cosmic um, underlying kind of cosmic principle that uh, the universe is based on, um, and then. Da- a Taoist would seek to align themselves with this kind of cosmic process or pr- principle and, um, you know, thus uh, transform themselves in that way. And then essentially, like, either for the aim of, you know, becoming an immortal or uh, extending one's life or et cetera. Yeah. What's, what is the principle? So Tao is the underlying principle of the universe. So right. it's, an, it's an idea, not a thing. Not a force. Yeah, I think I think it's yeah I think it's kind of just an idea. Um, mm-hmm. I don't think, yeah, I don't think it has any kind of metaphysical like or physical, yeah, thing mm. uh, to it. Um, yeah, um, I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's sort of like infamously difficult to like describe, mm. um, especially with words. Um, so. Yeah, I realize I'm putting you on the spot here, but I think listeners should know. I mean, mm-hmm. the first word of the Tao Te Ching, or the first line, is the Tao that cannot. The Tao that can be Taoed is not the real Tao. So right. any speaking about the Tao means we're getting away from it. Right. So I'm asking you impossible questions right, to right. describe this thing. Maybe can we come at it this way? What's the Yin Yang, mm-hmm. or the Um Yang, the, mm-hmm. the the black and white symbol? That's often associated with Taoism. Right. Um, does that get us any closer to it? Can you give us something? Is it is that Taoist? What does it mean? Yeah, I would say that, I mean, I think perhaps that comes a little bit from the kind of shamanistic roots. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's generally largely associated with uh, Taoism and it's sort of like their official symbol. Mm. Um, yeah, um, yin and yang. I mean, so the root of yin and yang, uh, um, yang, mm. uh, is... <laughs> describing a hill and um, the sun striking a hill. Uh, so, like, the sun could only, you know, strike it in, what, half of the hill. So that half of the hill would be sort of young, you know. Uh, so they would, you know, derive uh, kind of, how would you say, um, I don't know, insights about that in terms of, like, young being active or maybe hot, uh, masculine, things like that. And then the cooler side, the dark side of the hill 
uh, is, you know, associated with the feminine and uh, being maybe cold and um, still, things like that. Uh, so that's kind of like the, I believe, the roots of that term. Um, and otherwise, yeah, I wanted to talk. So the Taiji symbol, you know, most people are familiar with is, you know, a circle and it has like a white dot and a black dot and um this side is mostly black, this side is mostly white. Yeah. Um, right. And so it's a little misleading maybe in, in terms of like it's just the – it would be almost better if that was like a gif or jif. Mm. Um, and it was like – because that symbol, um and yang, it's not a static thing. Uh, so if you were to watch, you know, um and yang at work, if you could in that way, it would be – so like um, – when yang reaches its climax and then yin begins and then when yin begins, <laughs> reaches its climax mm. yang begins and it's sort of like continuously changing in that way mm -hmm. um and so yeah um that's also i mean kind of touches that kind of process philosophy which is a yeah kind of a part of that this kind of thing um is there a difference between the yin and yang? And the, you said tai ji? Uh, that's just the name of the symbol. Oh, that's the name of the symbol. Right, right. Okay. And if you see the symbol, there is yin and yang and yang and yin, mm. right? And could you please describe it for us, please? Um, yeah, and I mean, it's just, um, the same symbol that's in the uh, in the crane flag, right? Yeah. Um, or a similar symbol. Um could could you describe yin and yang? Um, maybe or maybe not. Like yin, as I believe, is a very um masculine or very light, like like very bright thing. No, no, no. The yang is the thing, right? And yin is the feminine, mm -hmm. the dark, mm -hmm. and like wet thing, mm -hmm. maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, yang being more associated with fire. Yeah. Um, Guys, give me one second. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. This is very Taoist and natural. All right. Sorry. Can you tell me though? I've got a really weird question. So yang is the same yang as like yang san sun. Is that the same character? Like yin and yang, yang? Yang is the bright side of the hill. And when you have like the sun umbrella, mm -hmm. isn't that yang sun? As I believe, yes, maybe. I'm not sure, but that okay. possibly. Because you refer to yang as the sun, right? Mm -hmm. In that thing. So that's the same yang. Mm. So um is, it's not the moon, is it? Mm -hmm. is it the moon? Yeah. It's the sun and the moon. Right. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, they use this kind of these kind of concepts to like help t describe natural phenomenon as they see it. Yeah. Um, right. This is like way before science as we know it today. So this is just this was, in my view, this was these people's way of trying to explain, you know, why certain natural phenomenon are the way that they are. Mm. Um, yeah. And so yeah, as you said, like. Yang is associated with the sun, and um is with the moon, oh. and they have various animals that have different kinds of like, for example, a yang a dog is considered to have a lot of yang energy because um, they're quite you know, yeah they're quite active yeah. and bright and uh, etc. Whereas a cat is considered to have a lot of uh, yin energy, yeah, um, more feminine perhaps you could say. Uh, more passive, etc. Um, yeah, so, and I mean that, and it goes. To, um, <laughs> I don't, <laughs> I don't want to talk about. Uh, in it affects uh, going. I guess it goes back to what what is Taoism, mm. um, which is like a range of um, philosophical tradition, uh, you know, religious phenomena. Uh, dietary practices, uh, meditative practices, things like that. Mm. Um, and yeah, so uh, when, if someone was believed to have too much in, mm. um, in the past, mm. um, I believe in China, uh, they could have been prescribed, 
so to speak, to uh, consume some dog, <laughs> yeah, uh, which has more the yang energy, which would help to kind of balance that out. Uh-huh. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it goes yeah from way abstract to down to like very like you know kind of a medical prescription. Mm. Um, they actually, you know, which is interesting because they actually use these kind of concepts to, you know, influence their lives. Um, yeah. Is there a difference when there's sometimes you see the yin and yang and it's just black and white, and sometimes you see it with the two dots inside? So the one t- at some points, the yin and yang is just one sort of white fish, and the other half is mm-hmm. a, one black fish, and mm-hmm. they're like two fish chasing tails going round and round. But sometimes you see it with a white dot in the black section mm-hmm. right. and a black dot in the white section. Right, right, right. Are they the same symbols? The, for example, the Korean flag mm-hmm. on the front of the tekuki. It's got a red and blue one, mm-hmm. but they don't have the dots in each part. Mm-hmm. Is there anything going on there? Are they just spots on the uh, hill? I believe that it's the same, and I, I think that it's um, when you see the dots in yeah. in that kind of symbol. Uh, I believe it's just kind of hinting at, um, you know, the that side. You know, let's say this side is the maximal young, mm. uh, the uh, <laughs> the white side, mm. uh, but it has this little little black dot in there, and then. If you were to watch, you know, like in a time lapse or what have mm. you, uh, that black dot would grow and grow and grow, and then this side would decrease and it would sort of flip. Mm. Um, so I believe it's the same symbol that you're referring to. Yeah, the, with the koi fish, I yeah. think you've seen that kind of uh, symbolism in like Avatar: The Last Airbender, or I saw it in um, Alan Watts videos. Mm-hmm, he would spin mm-hmm. a, a fish around like mm-hmm. that. Is it trying to tell us this yin and yang? symbol that there's no absolutes because the western tradition is like there's god and god is the absolute goodness right there's that there's pure is yin and yang trying to tell us there's nothing pure there's nothing perfect that in good there's bad in bad there's good it's all it's all relative man is, or not uh when i first took uh when I was first introduced to Taoism mm. as an undergrad, mm. uh, I took a course on, yeah, it was an introduction to Taoism. Yeah. And my professor never, I was very conscious of this, he never used uh, the labels like good and bad when referring to uh, um and young. Okay. Um, yeah, but I think, yeah, I mean, so, yeah, we can talk about this later perhaps, but... Um, <laughs> I think uh, in the Joseon dynasty also, they used, um, you know, yeah, this kind of symbolism still existed and was uh, used in some ways. Um, but I think in that time, uh, there was a lot of young <laughs> energy going on there. Mm-hmm. Um, and they were, yeah, they would sort of embrace that aspect of it, but then they would, you know, uh, maybe push the yin or um mm. aspect of it kind of to the side. Um, yeah. It's, yeah, I know it can be used, all, all religions and ideologies can be used for nefarious purposes, and perhaps that's what was happening during the, the latter stage of the Joseon dynasty. I think what I was trying to get at is not necessarily in terms of good or bad, but maybe absolutes. And when I read Taoism or the Tao Te Ching and Lao Tzu's book, that there was nothing in there that felt like an absolute, like a maxim. Everything was all very... Mm-hmm. Uh, ambiguous and it was always like well it's good news or it's bad news or you never quite know don't take it for granted whereas other religious texts or other philosophies they kind of have absolutes in there and maxims whereas Taoism you could read it and it's just like well beautiful people are ugly ugly people are beautiful mm-hmm. I don't mean to go into yeah. good and bad but it's this idea that nothing is 100% that no yeah I, to- I, I, I got you yeah. um yeah, so that kind of goes towards the like kind of process philosophy aspect of it, um, where Taoism a big thing in there is uh, the impermanence of things, um, and you know later on we'll talk about um, life and death and mm. uh, seeing that as not a good or bad, but accepting both and accepting both gladly. Mm. Um, yeah. So and uh, as with the Taiji symbol. Mm. Um, it's constantly flowing. It's not, you know, changing. It's not something that is, it's not a fixed, you know, symbol as it is in, you know, a picture. Um, yeah, I, th- I think it would be better served to be as a, 
GIF or JIF, whatever you prefer. Mm. It's interesting that even a symbol cannot capture Taoism or that element of mm -hmm. it. It's meant to be moving. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why is it red and blue in the Korean flag? Is, is, is there no reason for that? Are we thinking too much? Because it's black and white in my mind. Mm -hmm. Is that just my mind or do you think? You no, 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 no. Um, I think it, most commonly it's um, black and white. Okay. Um, but I mean, I think, I'm, I'm not sure exactly why it's blue or red in the Korean flag, but um, ah, I'm not sure. But I believe, you know, the Korean flag has evolved over time, and mm. I believe maybe previous versions had a black and white version of it. I'm not exactly sure on that, but... I maybe. think I saw, like, black and white version of a flag, and it just evolved. Okay. Maybe that was before color was invented. <laughs> 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 they just do it in black and white. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. But I, I, I think it's, it's hinting at the same symbol, yeah, uh, regardless of the color. Maybe in that instance, the red would be yang and blue mm. would be... Um, Okay, so we have that, and that's the say the name of the symbol. Taiji. Taiji. Yeah. Yeah. Or uh, Teguk. Is that mm. the same name? I believe so. Teguk refers to the symbol in the middle. Oh, this is new yeah. to me. For me, I call it Teguk. Teguk is the name of the flag, right? And so yeah, that symbol that, is the Teguk. Yeah, Teguk key, the yeah. Teguk flag, yeah. and Teguk. Oh wow! I didn't know that. This is brilliant. Thank you for teaching me. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's, I go back to school. So that's one of, I think, something we associate with Taoism. Um, Wu Wei. Mm -hmm. I think this has a lot of ideas in Taoism. What's Wu Wei in Chinese or Korean? Is it Mu Wei? Mu Wei. Yeah. Okay. Can you? <laughs> here's another difficult question for you, Will. Right. Could right. You, could you explain Mu Wei for us? Wu Wei. Yeah, I'll try. So um, this term is often used or excuse me translated as something like effortless action um i've i've seen it translated one time a little clumsily as a what non-coercive action um and yeah i mean what it's trying to get at is actually um yeah i'll, I'll do it through uh one of the stories in Zhuangzi. i think it mm. gets at this concept quite well it's the uh, story about cook ding or butcher ding. And so there's this uh, butcher, mm -hmm. and he is carving an ox or cow um, with his knife. And he's doing it quite skillfully. And along walks a duke, the local duke. Um, mm -hmm. And the duke inquires to him as, like, uh, as to this butcher's skill, amazing skill at... at the way he's doing it is just so effortless in that way. Um, and the butcher then, just, you know, explains a little bit and that he goes for the knots and he does not slash or chop. Um, and the butcher also boasts that he has had the same knife for decades without needing to sharpen it. Whereas, you know, an inexperienced cook would have to sharpen it every year or something like that. He's had it for decades without the need. And it's still the sharpest as if it was as if it were new mm. um and yeah i mean he d describes it almost like in a kind of dance like motion the way he cuts this ox and the clumps of the ox the meat mm. falls like clumps of earth um and yeah so i think that's that's the story um but there's a little bit of like interesting kind of subtle meaning going on there in terms of uh, which is something that you can see in Zhuangzi happen a few times in that a butcher in that time in China and in Korea, uh, it was a low position. It was like uh, maybe in Europe, the equivalent would be like a coal a person who sells coal. Mm -hmm. um, it was considered dirty and like a sanitation worker or something like that. Mm. Um I love sanitation workers. So I just, um, but anyway, like the untouchables in the Indian caste system. Perhaps, or perhaps yeah, very um, lowest of the low. Yeah, it was it was a lowly position, and so for this duke, this you know great noble person, the best greatest one in the area, mm. to come along and to inquire, you know, ask this uh, butcher and learn from him, and um, you know appreciate what he's doing. It was um, not likely to have happened in reality, but. Mm. Uh, Zhuangzi does, you know, 
does in his story. And um, yeah, I think th- there's that there's that little kind of subtle meaning going on there as well. Um, in terms of like you can, you can learn from anyone, and you don't have to be you know so, oh I'm so high and mighty Duke that um, I can't learn or I can't uh, appreciate or interact with some lowly you know peasant. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, essentially, I mean the story is getting at um, it's. I think that there's some essays written about this, but I, it's like you can think of Wu Wei in action. Um, or <laughs> in reality, mm-hmm. as um, maybe like in uh, in terms of flow state, you know, kind of psychological kind of mind state in which, you know, it's considered like peak performance, but there's not any kind of, you know, you can't, you can't force it, mm. a, a flow state. It just kind of naturally occurs um, when you're doing something that is difficult, but not too difficult, but, mm. and not too easy. Um, and yeah, so, and then in Zhuang, so there's other stories that kind of get at this kind of, uh, peak performance, um, with the sense of ease. Um, and I think that kind of describes, uh, Wu Wei in terms of, you know, a practical aspect of it. Yeah. There's when the great leader leads without leading and, Nothing is done, but everything is done. I think this is what, what uh, this might be more Lao Tzu's mm-hmm. approach to it yeah. uh, that I remember reading in the Tao Te Ching. But if you try to uh, push the pendulum to the right, the pendulum swings to the left. And if you try to push the pendulum to the left, the pendulum swings to the right. So when you try to do something, it often has the reaction you don't want. So the only thing to do with the pendulum is just let it swing. Mm-hmm. Do nothing, and then everything works. It's like if you try to be cool, you're not going right, to be cool. Right. Mm-hmm. Or if you try really hard to lead and influence people, it doesn't work. Mm. You do it by not doing it. And then everything kind of falls into place. I mm-hmm. just finished reading um, Zen in the Art of Archery. Mm-hmm. And there was this description on there. It's about a, a German guy trying to learn archery in uh, Japan in the 1920s and 30s. And he describes the snow piling up on the cherry blossom leaf. And the snow keeps piling up on the cherry blossom leaf until there's enough snow that it falls off. But the cherry blossom leaf doesn't move. It doesn't push the snow off, but it waits until it's awful and then it falls in a perfect motion and then fills up again. So there's this idea that don't force something, just Mm -hmm. let things Mm -hmm. go. And then you get it. And that's the perfect flow state, isn't it? Right, right. I think that, yeah, that totally gets at it. It seems like it should have lots of, well, it seems like it could be criticized. Don't try too hard. It seems very Mm un-Korean, right? It feel like it's not something that would vibe in modern life, this idea of Wu Wei. Um, Yeah, perhaps. Um, It sort of goes against the kind of grind culture or something like that. Yeah, I think so. But um, (laughs) I think perhaps uh, people and maybe we can talk about this later, people could be better served, perhaps, mm. if they do some kind of activity or something that they enjoy uh, in which they enter this, these flow states and um, or, you know, just, just chill out and, mm-hmm. um, yeah, just don't just grind themselves into, into a pulp in which, you know, and we're seeing in modern culture people are becoming increasingly more depressed and et cetera, mm. um, even though their monetary needs are met by and large um, and things like that. But, um, yeah, so I think that, uh, and I believe that I've read a few kind of psychological studies uh, that are going at this from Mm -hmm. that angle. Um, And they think the study concluded that it would be, people could be better served uh, doing kind of flow state activities and they would be, they tend to be more happy Mm -hmm. the more that they engage in those kind of activities. Yeah. Yun so do you have a take on Wu Wei, this concept of Mu Yi? Mm. Personally, I thought of the like Socratic method of teaching because mm. you said that like um, the people from higher like hierarchy, mm. like the Duke you said in the story, can learn from like lowest of the lower levels of the people. And the Socratic method talks about a similar thing, I guess, because the um, teacher does not really teach about things 
but like by asking questions they can learn from it and maybe i think that sometimes the teacher would get some new approaches and learn from it mm. so yeah that's why i thought of it awakening the answers within and things yeah. like that yeah that's why we all need butcher ding in our lives to, right. <laughs> to do this i like that though um in terms of the socratic method because like often in these in the stories uh with socrates uh he would sort of let that the, his interlocutor speak and kind of let them make their own mistake mm -hmm. and then he would go in and correct them or show them you know their uh inconsistencies etc mm -hmm. yeah yeah and i guess that's where maybe the differences are with confucian confucianism where there is more hierarchy where the master said this and there are all these ideas you said that wu wei and the by doing things by not doing it it must attract a lot of hippies <laughs> this idea think, no but it feels yeah. like a very hippie kind of idea mm -hmm. it's not like confess and get down on your knees and submit to Allah and you mm, are not worthy no. uh, Taoism seems to bring a very different vibe to it yeah I think I would agree with that and I think kind of the Alan Watts that kind of time period I think yeah, yeah in which he found it he found so many um, people who are attracted to that kind of those needs kind of new East Asian ideas mm. um yeah, I think I think that there's kind of a, you know, go with the flow, kind of just relax, vibe mm. with whatever happens, accept it. Um, there's that kind of thing going on. There's a very famous interview with Bruce Lee as well, the martial artist. And uh, he, he's such a charismatic man. The intensity is in his eyes. But he's there on American television saying, be like water, my mm -hmm. friend. You mm -hmm. see that water can flow and it can be soft, but it can also crush. And it feels the whatever cup you put it in. So if you put water in a round cup, water becomes round. And if you put water in a long cup, it becomes long. Water is empty. Mm -hmm. But by being nothing, therefore it's everything. Mm -hmm. That's kind of getting to that. Yeah, I think I think that was probably influenced by kind of Taoist ideas, I, I believe so. Is there a difference between Taoism and Zen? Because I just talked, when I was reading this Zen in the Art of Archery, it just popped up on my shelf. It's all very like the the archer and the target should become one and the teacher should become the pupil and the pupil should become the teacher and the start becomes the beginning and you have to shoot by not shooting don't let go the 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 arrow has to let go it's all about this not doing things so mm -hmm. is there a, a connection between zen buddhism and and taoism yeah I yeah definitely i think so um uh zen coming from that would be the Japanese name for this tradition, Chan in Chinese, or uh, Son in Korea, mm. Son Bulgyo. Oh, Son Bulgyo. Yeah, it's the same okay. as in, yeah. Mm. Um, and, yeah, I mean, that kind of gets at to, like, how Buddhism became uh, Chinese Buddhism, mm. um, or how, you know, Indian Buddhism, you know, when it came... It was sort of just stayed as Indian Buddhism. They were just the monks were just diligently translating and etc. But it kind of remained Indian Buddhism by and large. But then over time, mm. um, it took on aspects of indigenous Chinese thought and transformed into what we can call uh, Chinese Buddhism. Mm. Um, and yeah, it's um, yeah Buddhism and Taoism especially are very famous for. Um, having debates and for example uh i just read a book um that was speaking to the uh, 13th century china um where genghis khan was the big the big boss of the time and um in that kind of time period there was a debate between buddhists and taoists at, at the official you know kind of imperial court mm. and Unfortunately, the Taoists uh, kind of lost, they lost that debate. And then the Buddhists um, were able to take, uh, I think, 36 of the Taoist temples as their own. Um, but yeah, I mean, other than that, like there's been a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of interaction between Buddhists and Taoists. And um, also that helped to, I mentioned the second, uh, second century CE, mm. um, China, where yeah, Taoism um, became what we can call a uh, religious Taoism. And that was, and over time, that was in large part due to its interaction with Buddhism, um, mm. which 
at the time was, you know, could be considered a more, um, a more mature uh, thought tradition, perhaps. It's a little, a little older and it had, um, yeah. So uh, at the time, in early Taoism, there weren't any like, um, or it wasn't organized, mm-hmm. I, I suppose. And Buddhists sort of helped bring that kind of organizational structure in terms of like having a monastery and like there's Taoist monks and or priests as they're sometimes called or Taoist nuns and kind of having that kind of like structured community um, that sort of didn't really exist um, prior to that. Uh, And that was in large part, I believe, to the influence of, yeah, uh, Buddhism. I just wrote down Taoist nuns because I've never heard that before and it sounds really interesting. Neither, yeah. I wonder what a Taoist nun looks like. I think there should be an indie band called Taoist nuns. <laughs> <laughs> I would go and see them. I I love the idea that there was a, an argument in, in the imperial court with the arrival of the threat of Genghis Khan between the Buddhists and the Taoists. You said, unfortunately, the Taoists lost. But I love the idea that the Taoists would lose because that's also that their greatest strength is their greatest weakness. I can imagine the Taoist just goes, oh, yeah, we lost. Who cares? <laughs> Good news and bad news. What draws you to Taoism, Will? Because if I passed you in the street, I wouldn't look at you and go, geez, and so there goes a Taoist. Look right. at you. I mean, it's, <laughs> but you seem to have been drawn to it to devote your life to What is it about Taoism that brings you in? Ah, um, I mean, yeah, so that kind of goes back to a little bit of like how I kind of got into philosophy. Um, that was like, yeah, I guess my junior year of college and I had just sort of recently, um, what changed my major. I originally, my first year I was a political science student Mm -hmm. and then I took a, uh, critical thinking class, um, that second this my second semester of college and it was essentially like a logic course um and actually i didn't really like i didn't really like the course and actually i didn't do very well in it Mm. um because it's quite um algebraic in some ways um but it and i had always liked literature reading etc and language um but it so it changed it just changed my perspective as to like what what you can do with language i guess and you know like you're breaking down sentences into just like a plus b equals c things like that um and yeah i just never had i'd never come across that kind of um yeah logic um formal logic uh in in school prior to that and so that just kind of changed my perspective um, and really like, wow, okay, what is this? And then I, yeah, I took a, took the intro to course to Taoism. And I, the first text that I read in that kind of tradition was the Lao Tzu. And at the, I don't know, I just felt like it was just more interesting than reading or learning about European philosophy. Um, <laughs> My, my advisor right now is he's a Kant specialist. Oh dear. Um, but I, I just can't. Maybe he'll change my mind because I'm still in my first semester. So, um, but I just at the moment I, I just can't really get super hyped about oh, gonna learn about Kant today. Mm. Um, whereas I don't know Taoism. It just um, again it, it just kind of changed my perspective because I was never really familiar with um, East Asian thought. I guess prior to that. And this was sort of my like gateway into un- trying to better understand what's going on there. Um, yeah, but and also partly it's especially at my former university, SKKU, Sun Kim Kwan, mm-hmm. um, where I did my MA um, in Korean philosophy. Um, the Korean philosophy department was essentially a Confucian studies department. I mean, in all but name, um, all, all of the students uh, were studying Joseon Dynasty, Neo-Confucianism. Um, and to me, that was just so disappointing in some way because mm-hmm. Korean philosophy is so much more than just just Joseon Dynasty, Neo-Confucianism. 
Um, I mean, that's a huge aspect of what we can call Korean philosophy, but um, there's more to it than that. And um, yeah, there was just me, and then eventually another student came who was studying, also studying Taoism. Um, and that was it in the whole department who, you know, had different interests. Um, and there's no one who studied Buddhism as far as I know. So um, that, that kind of, um, I don't know, black sheep, kind mm-hmm. of a thing I kind of enjoy yeah being different in that way or yeah pursuing something different than what what would normally be pursued mm. it feels like there's I don't know it's always felt like to me that there was an answer at the bottom of Taoism or if you're studying Kant or something like this you're you're understanding certain ways of seeing the world but if you study Taoism and get to the the bottom of it it's like there's a mystery in there and if you understand this mystery your world will change. You'll fundamentally see the world in a different way. And not everybody's going to see the world and not everybody's going to find that mystery. It always mm-hmm. felt to me that there was a, it was it's almost like playing a game or it's something more than philosophy. There's a, there's a secret in there. Is there a secret in Taoism? It's a, it's a very stupid question. I know what I'm asking you as a serious student of, of Taoism, but. Uh, no, I think you're, I don't, I, it's not a stupid question at all. I think, um, there's definitely a mysterious aspect to uh, Taoism, and part of, partly what makes it so like slippery or difficult to like pin down what is this. Mm. Um, and in many uh, Taoist, you know, uh, when if you become an ordained uh, Taoist priest, you can take on a Taoist name, and in many of those names, um, there's uh, the term mystery or mysterious. Mm-hmm. Uh, they use these kinds of terms or in early Taoist religion, um, there were uh, people who received uh, texts sort of mysteriously, mm. um, or they weren't, and they weren't supposed to be shared with students who were not ready for it. Um, and yeah, so I think that there definitely is this kind of air of mystique about about it. Yeah. Mm. Maybe that's why you don't look like a Taoist. That's why he's tricking us, right? So you just, nobody's going to look at you. Will, I, I, I say this with no disrespect. Mm-hmm. They go, well, there goes a Taoist. Maybe that's the point. Maybe that's the point. You've mentioned a couple of times the Lao Tzu, mm-hmm. a book that I know is the Tao Te Ching. Mm-hmm. Um, can you, I, I guess, maybe tell us, this is often seen as I know it, the first book of Taoism, a collection of 82, 88 poems, something like that. The man's name is very mysterious. Can you tell us perhaps how you understand this book or can you unload some, what's it in Korean? Tao Te Ching? Yeah. Todokgyong. Todokgyong. Okay. Yeah, and Laosu being Noja. 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 Mm. Um, yeah, I can. Uh, as you say, it is often seen as the beginning of what we can call Taoism um, and is often seen as the first Taoist text. Um, mm. But... Yeah, because, um, uh, what, I guess the written material at the time, you know, people were using silk or (laughs) bamboo strips, um, things like that. Um, And they would put these texts in tombs and exhume, you know, uh, people with with these texts. Mm. Um, Yeah, a lot of things were damaged and destroyed over time and robbed from, you know... uh, or yeah, just robbed, um, plundered. And so it's difficult to point down exactly when that text was written. Uh, but most people think it's roughly fourth century BCE. Mm. Um, and yeah, they, I guess a lot of people do put it as the first text in the Taoist tradition. Uh, there is another text called the Ne Ye, uh, translated as a inward training. And, um, it can be, it was also written roughly around the same time, and some people think it's a little older, and they think that it influenced the Lao Tzu. Um, yeah, but uh, anyways, for our discussion, yeah, Lao Tzu. Um, supposedly, the story goes, written by Lao Tzu, um, who was a sort of like small-time bureaucrat um, in that time, and upon... He was going to travel, traveling on an ox. And in many paintings, you'll see him traveling, riding on an ox, Mm. um, riding to the West 
and sort of like doing the first kind of journey to the West uh, in which he was going to go there and teach people about the Tao. And upon reaching a gate um, on that journey, the gatesman asked, begged <laughs> Lao Tzu to please write uh, his thoughts on the Tao and et cetera. And supposedly the Lao, Lao Tzu acquiesced and then wrote this text. Um, which we still have today, and I believe uh, it's, I've seen it quoted that it's the second most translated text aside from the Bible. Mm. Um, yeah, so, in that, I mean, again, it kind of goes maybe to perhaps that kind of slippery nature of um, there's no, like, there's no perfect translation of this text, and so it's still having to be continuously redone or... Um, addressed from a different perspective, et cetera. Um, yeah, as you said, it's it's really a rather short text. Um, people often see it these days as a kind of political, philosophical text. Um, they see it from that kind of perspective. And although, interestingly, in Korea, and there's more and more research coming on this recently, mm. um, the textual history in Korea for the Lao Tzu is um, like very late um, in terms of uh, translating it into Hangul um, and then even really being in wide circulation. Um, I mean, like, as recent, like, like modern times mm -hmm. um, is when it really started to, like, be translated into Hangul for the first time, like, I believe the 60s. Wow. Um, this, yeah, ancient text, which, yeah. I mean, there's in the Samguk Sagi, uh, it's recorded that a Pekje general did, as you said, and um, as you quoted earlier, and that like not pressing the attack too far and like letting them go, and then um, yeah, not not forcing that in that mm -hmm. way, and um, that was all the way, you know, that was a Pekje general. So I mean, and interestingly, that was before uh, what is recorded to be the first. Uh, official acceptance of Taoism into Korea. That was some century or two before that. Mm. Um, this, and, But this general, um, who was not a scholar or literati, um, he had already read it enough to be able to quote it in that instance. Um, but, yeah. Um, what does the book say? What's in the book? I mean, if we were to try to distill some of the... The message is we've given the first line, the mm -hmm. Tao that can be Taoed is. How do you understand that first line, maybe? Maybe mm -hmm. that's too big a question to ask at the start. What, what does the book say, Will? Yeah, I mean, it's, diff it's, it's difficult. Yeah. Um, and as part of that, it can, it's been interpreted uh, and reinterpreted in, through many different lenses. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, I see, I see it after my in the intro class. Mm. The professor kind of later on, when after we had read bits of uh, bits of it, mm. um, he kind of gave us that lens and like that he sees it as a philosophical text. Um, so you have like, yeah, you have aspects of it. And it talks about society, how society should be structured, or how a ruler should act. Um, things like that um but then also do you have things like the first line that you mentioned or mm -hmm. there's in the early uh, parts of it there's um some lines discussing uh creation or aspects of there's lots of kind of water symbolism in the mm -hmm. text um and yeah um <laughs> it's <laughs> anyways i mean so yeah i mean I'll go to the thing that I'm more familiar with in, the, in terms of like these kind of modern um, reinterpretations of the text. Mm. Um, in the 1960s, um, it was first reinterpreted and translated into Hangul uh, by uh, Christians, um, early, yeah, Korean Christians who um, found this, <laughs> you know, they tra found this text and they tried mm. to like interpret it through their, you know, lens. Um, and 
so in that way, I don't know, it's kind of interesting because like maybe it goes back to with the, as you said, with the Buddhist um, Buddhism, like one could in theory be a Buddhist Christian or mm. et cetera. It's not like a, yeah, the belief thing is not uh, really as a, a part of um, Taoism or Buddhism. Mm. And so, um, yeah, so you had these early Christian um, uh, Koreans and they were reinterpreting the text through their perspective. And yeah, I mean, that that was, uh, yeah, I mean, that's like when it was first put into Pongol, I believe, was mm-hmm. the 1960s. By Korean Christians as right, well. Right, right. So, yeah. Yeah. I always found when I read the Tao Te Ching, and I'm, I'm so sad I don't have a copy of it with me today here, but every time I read it, I don't find anything that doesn't make sense. For example, if you read the Bible or if you read old texts, you, you find something that's a bit, you know, it doesn't vibe with modern society. If they're talking about slaves or something like that, you're going, mm-hmm. yeah, okay, that's of its time, right? There are some you find like that. But whenever I read the Tao Te Ching, I never found anything that caught me out of the moment like that, that stuck me out uh, as being wrong. But at the same time, if you used logic to understand it, it mm. would never work. Mm-hmm. If you tried to do A plus B equals C, mm-hmm. it didn't make sense. You just had to... Um, you know when you see those, I don't know what you call them, third eye pictures or magic eye pictures. It's like a, a picture illusion. And to see the image in there, you have to cross your eyes. Mm-hmm. And underneath everything, there's a, there's a dolphin or something mm-hmm. like that. I really found when I was reading the Tao Te Ching that I had to just shut off my brain and just allow the words to come to me. And you wouldn't really be sure what was going in, but there was something in there that didn't like logic, that didn't <laughs> like rational thinking. Right. And if you just let it wash over you, that was how you were meant to read it. Mm. Yeah, I totally agree with you with that. Um, and I mean, the first line, the way that can be spoken is not the true way. Mm. Um, it, it's sort of attacking exactly that, like attacking language, logic, um, saying that, yeah, and uh, you can't you can't capture this thing with... Um, with that kind of a mindset, um, mm. yeah. Alan Watts used to hit a stick on the floor whenever he wanted to describe it. Mm. So instead of saying the word, mm. he would just make a sound. Mm. Mm. Like this is the sound, and it was meant to like uh, capture people's attention and, uh, and draw them to it or something like that. Yeah. Do you have to read the Tao Te Ching at school? In Not Cor- really. We just no? hear about it as like a part of the subject. Okay. Okay. Fascinating. I'm going to go back and read it now. I'm all excited mm-hmm. to read the Tao Te Ching because each page is just like a, a four-line poem or something. And I think the translation is be very important. The second book of Taoism, um, I always pronounced it as the Chang Tzu, mm-hmm. Chang Tzu, something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, can you tell us a little bit, because this is an incredibly different book. Yes. And it's interesting that sort of we sometimes think of religions or philosophies they have one book but here we have the Lao Tzu and then we have the Chang Tzu do you know anything about this I saw a brilliant meme this week and I forgot to send it to you shout out to Min Su Kang that posted it it was a picture of Chang Tzu right and you know that yes no meme where someone's <laughs> struggling to press the red button or blue button it was a picture of Chang Tzu and on the yes it was a picture of him and on the no it was a picture of a butterfly <laughs> and he was unsure which one to press and I saw <laughs> that and I was like, oh yes that's nice yeah I haven't seen that yeah um yeah I, I can talk more about the songs I'm more familiar with it. Okay. Um, yeah, that was written maybe late 4th century or 350 uh, BCE. Um, so most people believe it was written a little, just a little later. After, it's quite um, similar time though, yeah, isn't it? Quite yeah, quite similar. Um, yeah, and I mean, at the time, uh, it's really un- unfortunate. Uh, it's original. <laughs> difficult to say original um like Lao Tzu I didn't actually maybe I didn't even mention that um Lao Tzu is whether or not that was an actual person or not is still debated in academic papers Mm. um people um yeah 
still up up for debate it as means to whether old or not. man or something right it? right something like it just means right old dude um yeah um yeah so it's sort of seen as you know myth, uh, kind of a mythical figure and mm. zhuangzi is um quite quite similar um we're not sure the zhuangzi uh named after the author mm. uh we're not sure whether that author existed or not um Although I think maybe perspective is shifting um, towards uh, the Zhuangzi is divided into three parts: inner chapters, uh, outer chapters, and miscellaneous chapters mm. um, in antiquity, uh, and also more and more today. Perhaps uh, people think that Zhuangzi uh, wrote that those inner chapters is like a six, a six or seven chapters, um, but yeah. Anyway, so. Um, so it's um, it's a multivocal text. Um, mm. So there's many authors over time uh, that wrote and redacted this text, and in its kind of more most full form, there was uh, 52 chapters. Um, but then, in you know, uh, I don't know, uh, 600 years after it was written, mm. um, it was edited by Guo Zhang. Um, who also wrote the most uh, notable commentary on it. And it was reduced from those 50-some chapters down to 30-some chapters. And Guo Xiang, uh kind of dispensed with chapters that he felt were more of like kind of, uh, maybe you could use this to woo-woo. Mm-hmm. Um, Guo Xiang's much more of a kind of rational person in that way. Um, and, or... It, he dispensed with chapters that which he felt were repetitive, mm-hmm. um, which would kind of hint towards the uh, you know multivocal nature of the text. Um, people kind of riffing off of each other in terms of like a jazz performance. You can mm. think of it in like that way. Um, yeah, and so that that version, the thirty some chapter version, is the only one. It's the only exotic version that we have uh, today, uh, unfortunately. So, what does it say? What does it tell us? The Shuangzi is considered one of the best examples of Chinese literature. Um, and it's filled with parables and stories um, in the same way that the Tao can, that cannot be Tao. The mm. Tao that can be Tao is not the Tao. Mm. Um, it's filled with stories and examples of something what an approximation of what the Tao is or what Wu Wei is or um, how to attain that. Mm. Um, and like the story I gave you with the cook ding, butcher ding, mm. um, the uh, butterfly parable, there's many, yeah, it, it's filled with many parables, basically. What 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 is the meaning of the butterfly parable or, or what does it symbolize or... Could you, because I just briefly gave it in meme form, which we all understood, but mm-hmm. there might be some people that are not quite familiar mm-hmm. with it, perhaps. Yeah, um, so that goes, it's very short. Um, mm-hmm. And I'm not, maybe that's why it became probably the most famous part of the, uh, of the text, but um, it is Zhuangzi takes a nap, and in that he dreams that he's a butterfly and... Im- has that butterfly perspective and he forgets that he was he's a man uh dreaming mm. and then goes about his butterfly life <laughs> and <laughs> upon waking up yeah. um he because it felt so real and he totally embraced that kind of pr- butterfly perspective he was unsure if he w- if he dreamed that he was a butterfly or if the butterfly uh, dreams that he is Zhuangzi. Um, and so that little story tries to go at, it's been interpreted a few ways. Um, one is it's trying to attack, um, maybe attack a kind of humanist perspective mm-hmm. and that um, humanist, humans are the supreme creation and everything else is we can subjugate it uh, to our will as we please. Um, it can be interpreted in that way or um, also um, attacking like fixed perspectives. Um, and 
Ah, there's another kind of... Uh, um, okay. Actually, I wrote a... Can I read? Yeah, I wrote, yeah, wrote, yeah. Uh, I did a little reading on uh, from uh, Professor Mueller. And he wrote that it, yeah, is trying to break that break down distinctions between self and other and a reminder about the impermanence of those distinctions and kind of what I said, the vanity of human existence. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it kind of goes to maybe, I, I'm not, I, I don't want to say that it's hinting at this or not, but it could be interpreted as, um, yeah, I mean, eventually, uh, you know, kind of a life and death thing. So eventually... I'm going to die. Yeah. We're going to die. Yeah. Uh, and then you could think of the the ki, the chi, that is us. Um, you, you know, uh, maybe it will be, we will be eaten by a worm. And then maybe, so part of us will become with that worm. And then maybe a bird will eat the worm. And then part of us will be, <laughs> will be connected with that. Mm. Um, and in our kind of next lives, we could be a bird or a uh, and the strong's a, even like a pellet for a slingshot or mm-hmm. um, a wheel of uh, a cart, etc. And yeah, so it, it's speaking to it could be speaking to that as well. Um, that you know this perspective that we have right now, the one that we oh we value so much, mm. um, it's very temporary, especially in, when you think of it in the very cosmic sense of things. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's maybe hinting at that as well. It's really interesting that there must have therefore been a great sense of individualism at the time that they were rallying against. Because if they're saying we need to, if the if the message is to try to get out of this head, to try to get out of this perspective, and to imagine that you're a butterfly or imagine that you're both the hill and the sun and the moon and all of these things that... They must have been doing that because some people were too focused on one perspective. Some people were too fixed in their position. And so this idea of individualism or egoism or that single perspective that we sometimes associate with modern world, if Taoism was sort of saying against that or rallying against that or at least speaking against that, Mm -hmm. there must have been that sense of individualism back then to rally against. Yeah, I believe so. Um and you could look at examples, <laughs> famously Taoists and Confucians butt heads and do not get, get along and clash with perspectives. Or in China, around that time, mm. uh, you had uh, the school of names or legalists or youngists, mm. and they kind of adopted an emphasis on language, maybe you could say logic mm-hmm. um, or an, an egoist perspective. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, it could have very well been speaking out against that. Is it a particularly Asian way of thinking? So this idea that I am you and you are me and I might be the butterfly and I associate this type of thinking with Asian thinking. I'll try to give you two examples of it and then maybe are we right to talk about Asian thought and Western thought or not? One of them is the idea that you have this question um where do you go after you die and and and, you know you've already mentioned this and many people might think about it but if you really try to think about it without thinking of culture or religion but deep down the question where do i go after i die and you think about it and then the next question you have is where do i come from before i was born Mm -hmm. and that birth and death are interconnected and we sometimes put them in this like time sequence order But in the grand scheme of things, sometimes the beginning comes before the end and the end comes before the beginning and and things move round. And that's the that's the better way to understand things, perhaps. Another thing, I'm not sure if I spoke about it on this podcast, but I learned this hokdam. um, uh, Why am I thinking kakdugi, not kakdugi? Kamagui. Kamagui nalge petorjinda. Is that right? Kamagui nalja petorjinda, maybe. Yeah, yeah. When the magpie flies the pair drops and there's no connection between these two events but they happen at the same time and I asked a group of like 400 people in a in a katok bang English people what's the English equivalent of this and everyone was like we haven't got one 
we haven't got one. We haven't got this expression that say two things unrelated happen at the same time. And that blew my mind that there's this expression, Korean expression, Asian expression, that two things can happen at the same time, be unrelated. And we only think in cause and effect and things like this. All of this is me trying to ask you, Will, mm -hmm. is there an Asian way of thinking? It's, it's, it's a very dangerous question. Do you see what I mean? Because mm -hmm. of the stereotypes and generalization. Mm -hmm. Is there an Asian? Um, I mean, I, 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 I like, I like the question. Uh, I would maybe rephrase it a little because Asia is yeah. such a yeah. huge Thank continent. You. Um, yeah. and you know, has a rich history from well before, you know, where I'm from the U S mm. et cetera. Um, so in that way, I, I think I would be hesitant to say that there's an Asian way of thinking, mm. but, um, Perhaps um, if you narrow it down uh, in terms of like, is there an East Asian way of thinking mm. um, or a Southwest, Southeast uh, Asian way of thinking? Mm. Um, probably. Mm. I, th I, think, I think that there's something there. Yeah. Not just to, in terms of, but in terms of philosophy and in terms mm -hmm. of religions and mm -hmm. in terms of the code. So if we go into sort of comparative religions, if we think of Buddhism and Taoism and Sonbulgyo, Zen Buddhism, they do seem to share some uh, similarities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's, I think that's in part because, um, yeah, they, these countries interacted with each other over mm. these years and influenced one another. Um, and in profound ways. And yeah, so I think that there's, cause yeah, it's sort of a, you know, in this instance, it's a regional kind of thing. Um, mm. yeah, they did, uh, mutually influence one another. Um, so that there, there would be kind of, you know, similarities, uh, that you could find. Um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, Korea, um, in history, mostly, uh, Korea and China had, um, they were kind of uh, close in terms of their relations politically. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe you could say um, with trade, et cetera, um, and partly because they're you know they share a geographical kind of land uh, mm -hmm. way to uh, connect one another. Um, and whereas uh, Japan and China, um, yeah, they didn't get along. They were the two great powers in that area, uh, and Korea was kind of caught in the middle in between them and then sort of like um yeah had to, had to negotiate that mm. um and yeah so korea especially on japan korea had a quite a profound impact on uh especially early japanese culture mm. um yeah so i think i think that in terms of i mean even as far as uh in three kingdoms time three kingdoms korea times mm. um peck jay especially had uh, quite a close relationship with Japan um, in part because oh Shilla is over here and it's a powerful kingdom and it's you know mm -hmm. knocking on your door so it's good to be close friends with a powerful ally um, that could sail over and you know maybe perhaps put Shilla in their in their place um, so yeah from Pekje uh, to Japan uh, Pekje gave taught Japanese people uh, how to write with mm -hmm. Chinese characters and introduced their first, you know, the first writing system in Japan, um, and as well as Buddhism, maybe a little Taoism, Confucianism. Um, that, in some maps online, you can see that. In, you can see incorrectly, perhaps that uh, those, you know, these kind of uh, Chinese things originally mm. uh, went directly from China to Japan um, at the beginning, but that's that's not the case. Um, those went through Korea to Japan as a kind of um, intermediary mm. and so yeah perhaps korea kind of imprinted its own kind of korean influence um on on that and then delivered it to japan and there was korean uh, scholars who were tutors to japanese um princes and things like that so um yeah that's kind of a historical kind of a version of that answer but yeah mm. i think um in that way i think uh Historically, you could say, yeah, definitely that there would be an East Asian way of thinking mm. um, or an East Asian philosophy uh, in terms of 
<laughs> kind of um, non-dualism. <laughs> um, That's where I'm going with this. Right. Non-dualistic and non-monotheistic is what I'm really mm-hmm. trying to get at. There's yeah. not a god in the sky. Mm-hmm. And there's not dualism of mind and body right everything's just one man yeah it's It's, all connected it's all connected it's all connected and it's constantly changing and yeah that seems to be the way of thought here yeah i believe so and i get this though sometimes from my my wife or something if something good happens she'll say be careful nampian there's bad news coming or something like that Mm -hmm. or that i i get i feel this from her that it's uh not just dualistic and if you do well then you better be careful because you're about to come down and i'd never heard this before i would get congratulated in the past if i did something well but my wife's like no 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 these things work and she's not a taoist mm-hmm. but it's a frame of mind i think that she that she understands which is very different from an absolute or a monotheistic or it's not to say one is better or worse but just very different i feel right it, right right yeah there's kind of the lack of that going back to what you said about the cause and effect yeah. um yeah. yeah, I talk about the similar things with my friends, too, because when my friends are like going through hard times for like too long and the zero lucky thing is happening, mm. then I say to my friend, like, oh, so you fulfilled your like conditions for being um, unlucky. Yeah. So good things are about to come to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, s- speaking to that, there's uh, there's kind of an analogy that I uh, was um, that I came across from. Uh, Jin Park, mm-hmm. um, who uh, is a professor of uh, Buddhism, mostly Korean Buddhism, she specializes in. Mm. And it's an analogy of like uh, you're in a pool and you sink all the way to the bottom and to reach the floor. But it's and it's at that lowest point, the bottom point where you touch the floor, where you can push yourself up and then mm. ascend to the, you know, to the top and surface. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just thought that analogy when you yeah, said, yeah, "No, it's so good. Cool. Yeah, it is, and it's very much the, the the opposite of the trains of thought that we're used to in the West, which is the Buddhism and the Taoism. They sort of, and maybe the shamanism, they merge into each other and they become parts of each other. But yeah, yeah, I think yeah, and I mean, I've I've done um, a fair read, bit of reading on syncretism, uh, which you're kind of alluding to, of like. Uh, yeah, even I guess aside from maybe the middle late Joseon period, mm. um, there was like a kind of uh, you know the three as one mm. uh, in terms of like you didn't not an orthodox kind of like one way of thinking, and this is the best way. Um, yeah, uh, as you would see in something like Christianity, perhaps, um, in which like this is this is the way, and then mm. anyone else, we need to educate you because you got to get with the program. This, there's only one way. Mm. Um, there's there's I feel less, there's less of that in um, uh, early Korea and even today. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. There's less proselytizing, and there's. Uh you can't teach this way you can't understand this way in terms of the syncretism i think it was david mason who first made me realize something that i already knew that in korea shamanism and buddhism are sometimes the same thing that sometimes you go to a buddhist shrine and it's it's a picture of tangan halibut becoming a shin uh, a sanshin a mountain god with the tiger beside him in mm-hmm. the big red robes mm-hmm. and things like that but that's in a buddhist temple sometimes you see it and so those two religions sometimes it's very hard to draw Mm-hmm. Where Buddhism starts and shamanism ends, there are very k- key points, but yeah, yeah, this- definitely. Um, I'm and yeah, actually, I, I'm familiar with a little of Professor Mason's work, uh, and there's also uh, you can see Sanshin in um, you've probably seen them like Buddhist paintings, and there's like a hundred different figures in the paintings, and mm. some are big and some are small, mm. but in a lot of them you'll see. Um, one or a few figures who are uh, Sanchin, who are included in these kind of Buddhist pantheon paintings, mm. um, and which is really cool to me because I I'm not really aware of anything in you know like a <laughs> in a Christian painting. I don't think that there's an aspect of you know Islam or you know etc. that they would include in that in their painting um, in the same way. 
when I was in Italy in February, we were walking around um, various very old churches looking at paintings from the 1400s, 1500s. And I noticed in many of them that there was a black dude. And I say this with no disrespect, but there was, and this is 14, 1500s. And we worked out, it was probably, I forget the Italian name now, Giovanni Baptiste, John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. uh, in all of these paintings, there was a man that was visibly different from everybody else, and that was purported to be John the Baptist. Hmm. Did you see Pamio? This is a weird question. Do you see Pamio? The, the movie Ex Humor. It's called Pamyo, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, the Korean movie that's out at the moment that's getting 10 million views mm -hmm. about uh, shamanism and things like that. Mm. No? Okay. Hey, I haven't seen No, no, no. <laughs> right. You've just studied your PhD. I can imagine, yeah, that you've, <laughs> you've not seen um, this. How about this then? It's a similar question. Taoism in modern culture. Mm -hmm. So we talked about the Teguk, which I now know what that means. Mm -hmm. um, we talked... I'm thinking of... The uh, the book of Winnie the Pooh and the book of Tao. Mm -hmm. Do you see Taoism cropping up anywhere else now? You're studying it. Do you start seeing uh, it in movies or references, mainstream culture? Yeah, I do. Um, and yeah, as you mentioned it before, but the Kung Fu Panda. I, I need to rewatch that, and because yeah. I haven't seen it since I started studying this kind of thing. So, um, but I believe that there could be some kind of references in there. Um, I mean. You can see it, yeah, you can see it in modern culture, um, especially probably the most famous um, depiction in, like, uh, media mm. would be Sun Wukong, um, the Monkey King. Um, I don't know what this is. Oh, really? Yeah, okay. I don't know what the Monkey um, King is. Uh, do you know what the Monkey King is? Yeah, Sun Wukong thing. Yeah. <laughs> teach yeah, me, guys. Uh, so, Come on. So, um, I'm sorry, teach me. Oh, uh, no problem. Um yeah, so it's based on a uh, Chinese text, yeah. um, uh, Journey to the West, uh -huh. and it's about a yeah monkey who's and we can yeah I'd love to talk about this later. He he's born from a rock on a mountain, and he I don't know how I I haven't um anyways, but he somehow ascends to the heavens, mm. uh, particularly kind of Taoist heavens. Mm. Um, and through several ways, uh, such as there's a book of like the living and the dead and Sun Wukong, the monkey king, uh, strikes his name out of the book and in that way kind of becomes immortal. And then, uh, later on he eats, uh, these peaches of immortality, mm. these kind of sacred fruit. Uh, and in that way, again, kind of becomes, um, an immortal and, yeah, he trains and then he gains these kind of like fantastical power. So this, um, I mean, I'm sure, you, have you, are you familiar with League of Legends at all? No, Or um, I know what League of Legends or is, Or even uh, uh, Dragon Ball. I, I, again, I know what it is, but I'm, um, not, I'm Okay, sorry. so. You didn't see Pamyo, I haven't played okay, League yeah, of Legends. Yeah, yeah, we're, yeah. we're level. Um, How do you know about the Monkey King? It's a very famous thing in Korea. Okay, yeah. like it's on television? Not real, um, very like old animation, maybe, and you okay. and we hear it as like a fairy tale or the kind of things. Mm, okay, okay, I've seen it on at least one in Hiwa. Yeah, um, there's a building, I don't know, I feel like it's a hagwon, I'm not entirely sure, but there is a, kind of a little depiction of the monkey king. It's one of these things on if the I building. see it, I might recognize pa it perhaps. perhaps. Yeah. Um, and I believe I was told so. that, um, on traditional, um, Korean buildings, there's like these figures on the roof, mm. on the corners of the roofs. Yeah, that's... And I've heard that Sun Kong is one of those figures, actually, um, on these uh, kind of traditional Korean architecture. Mm. Um, but so that that's probably the most famous one. Um, so it's this monkey king. He has fantastical powers. Uh, or if you've seen maybe in like a Korean drama or perhaps in real life, um, Ki Gong. Uh, it's um, kind of a, you would see maybe people, maybe usually it's depicted as for Ajima mm. and parks and they're kind of like all in a group and like doing like, you know, different kind of like motions uh -huh. and... Um, tai Chi, I understand. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. That's Qigong? Right. Oh, that's Qi. Like yeah. energy Qi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Qi. Wow. And so they're, uh, you know, in doing these various motions and uh, through contemplating about it, I guess, uh -huh. while they're doing it. They're, you know, manipulating their chi, perhaps expelling 
bad ki and uh, accepting good ki things like that um that's that's uh an aspect of Taoism that we can we can see today um as well as um traditional chinese medicine or you know eastern eastern medicine mm. um i'd i'd love to read more about it there's definitely a relationship between Taoism and kind of traditional medicine um and when you say traditional medicine do you mean like dum do you mean acupuncture hanya yeah or, yeah perhaps those kinds of things of it, uh, or various like dietary uh practices um yeah. Is this Taoist when you have indigestion and like Ajima squeezed a bit? Have you ever I, had that? I, oh, that kills me. But yeah, it, it's, squeezing very, it's between a very painful. Yeah, fingers. it's a very sensitive yeah. little bit. Yeah. Uh, I'm not exactly sure if that has Taoist roots, yeah. but um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, there are things like that as well as, um, I don't know, in China, uh, actually, more recently, like in modern, very modern times, like mm. last 20, 30 years, um, the. Chinese government has become more open to accepting Taoists again, <laughs> and so and has sponsored many uh, reconstruction and construction of new temples and things like that. Mm. And so I saw uh, when I was um, preparing for this, I saw that there are um, millions of Chinese who self-identify as being Taoist today. Um, so it, it's still it's still around. Um, what what does it look like, or what do they? Because I can imagine a synagogue. I can imagine. A... Uh, a, a temple, I can imagine a, a cathedral, a church, a mosque. Um, Is there something in Taoist, or Taoist sort of evade any depictions? I'm not. I'm not super familiar with the aesthetics of what those temples look like. Uh. Um, but um, I mean, yeah. Or if you've heard the concept of feng shui, mm -hmm. that is kind of has Taoist roots. Uh, going at it, geomancy it's mm. sometimes translated as. Um, that's definitely a yeah. It has that has Taoist roots. Um, is, feng, is feng shui still a thing in Korea? It was like this big. What's feng shui in Korean? Where you're not meant to put your bed by the window or facing oh. the door. Feng shui. Feng shui. Oh, yeah. Feng shui. Yeah. I it? guess it is a thing because uh. my mom and dad has like specific ways to place a bed because like. Um, when it is like placed to the north side, mm. it means that um, it means bad luck because you put um, dead body towards like north side, mm. so it means bad luck. And like if, yeah, and as I believe, it's the thing like if the house is in front of the mountain and mm. the river is mm -hmm. in front of the house, then it's the good place yeah, for living. Yeah, that would be a great place. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, I want one of those. <laughs> yeah, a house in Korea, right? Yeah. 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 Um having yeah. a house and not having a house is the same thing, Will. We're mm. being Taoist. Right, right, now. right, right. right. Yeah. Um yeah, so that's definitely an aspect and I mean and that goes back like the way that Taoists um kind of there's there's a term, Buddha Taoist or um that is like in some ways and sometimes um certain sects are very difficult to like distinguish between like, is this a Buddhist sect or is this a Taoist sect? Mm. Um, so there is that thing going on. And so like they would arrange their uh, temples in a certain way, you know, mm. so like facing the East or et cetera, so, like uh, bring, bringing good fortune. Um, mm. And then like uh, the mountain and the river, that's like classic. And you see that kind of depiction in uh, various Sanshin paintings or Taoist paintings. Um, there will usually be a river and then mountains in the back. And then I think the si similar thing is going on with the, um, I feel like I'm going to butcher this, um, Iro Wong Bongdo, the mm. kind of five mountain peaks. And that is the famous painting that sat, uh, this painting sits behind the Joseon King's mm, throne. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then there's like yeah. the sun and the moon right there. That there's definitely, I feel like, um, some Taoist kind of things going on there. Mm. Um, and also because the there's always five mountain peaks depicted, and the five is a very uh, significant number in Taoism. Mm. Mm. Um, when you study all this, Will, are you a Taoist? I, I'm going to put you on the spot here. You might hate this question, but it's like maybe if you worked at McDonald's all the time, you would hate McDonald's. Or maybe to study this with some extent, you need some, I'm not sure what the word might be, objectivity 
objective distance. Mm -hmm. Does studying Taoism all the time have an effect on you? Do you become a little bit Taoist? Um, perhaps. I mean, especially in terms of the way that I'm still grappling with the thought of, you know, my mortality or something like that. Um, it does sort of help me to put that into perspective in a, in a certain way. Um, in that, yeah. So, I mean, I guess in that way, um, you know, it's definitely changing my perspective, but I, I don't think I would address myself as a Taoist practitioner mm. or something like that. Um, but yeah, please. Um, you've mentioned your mortality more than once. <laughs> uh, are you, you look very young. Are you seriously ill? I don't yeah, ask that. I'm, with... the, yeah, I'm 27 as far as I know, perfectly healthy. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, maybe that's <laughs> kind of like the philosopher's curse, and that they're yeah. always contemplating their own mortality. Um, but part part of that is um, when I first began studying philosophy, I was very interested in the Stoics, mm. um, figures such as Marcus Aurelius, yeah. uh, Seneca, um, uh, who were yeah influential in their time, and um, their I mean their concept amor fati. Mm -hmm. The um, is uh, from that tradition, uh, contem contemplating your own death, your own mm -hmm. mortality, and un accepting that that is a natural part of life. If you're born, you're going to die. Mm -hmm. And um, it's best to just not spend energy and time fretting about that, which is what I'm exactly what I'm doing. But that's what these people are advising to not do. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, and just accepting your fate. And in terms of that way, like, that kind of gets at to like the, the the difference as you addressed in that East East Asian philosophy and Western philosophy seem different in that way mm. in terms of like Western philosophy is very like logic driven and you know they try to lay out rational arguments mm -hmm. and um, consistent uh, whereas um, in the East perhaps you could say and but in early uh, in the early Western tradition the ancient Greeks. Um, philosophy was less of that kind of ac what it is today very mm -hmm. academic and um, yeah logic driven and it was a, more of a philosophy as a way of life mm -hmm. um, and in which you know it's a kind of set of principles etc uh, that help guide the way you think about yourself and the in your place in the world and how you interact with other people and things like that mm -hmm. um, the way you think about material possessions and all of that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. So I think, yeah, maybe more and more um, as I read these texts and mm. investigate further down the rabbit hole of Taoism, um, maybe that's rubbing off on me a little bit, but mm -hmm. um, maybe not totally, as you said. I'm not, uh, you know, I, I don't look particularly like what you might think of as a Taoist. But so. that's perfect, I think. <laughs> if you said you were a Taoist, then you wouldn't be a Taoist. I mean, that's a, that's one of the ideas. Uh, certainly, in pre-Platonic philosophy, you had uh, people like Heraclitus that uh, you can't step in the same river twice, and there were these ideas of change. But when you get to Plato and you get to the mm -hmm. theory of forms and there's this absolute sense of justice, this mm -hmm. absolute sense of beauty... And then from that, you get sort of the monotheism and the God that never changes. That does sort of cement itself in Western thought. You get thinkers like Nietzsche, Spinoza, uh, Schopenhauer, who are incredibly Buddhist and flowing in their, in their approaches about mortality. You mentioned Marcus Aurelius. He said, um, everybody suffers, but not everybody pities themselves. Mm. And Oh my God, I love that. That makes me feel so small because everybody has bad shit going on. Uh. You know, people suffer from all sorts of things, but you don't need to feel sorry for yourself. Another line that I like about mortality is this one: <clears throat> while I contemplate whether I'm that uh, moth on the ceiling or not that's just flown mm -hmm. in, um, every person has two lives, and their second life begins the moment they realize they only have one. Mm. That's good, isn't it? Mm -hmm. That's good. Because you think you're going to live forever and then something happens and you're like, Jesus, I might die one day. Mm -hmm. And once you realize that, you begin your second life. Mm -hmm. Once you realize you've only got one and there's a fabulous contradiction in that, that that's perhaps a little bit Taoist in its mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
Here's to long life. Can can I read you a Taoist poem and that sure. made us lead us into um, Igubo? Igubo. Um, this is his poem that I got from your work. Can you give me his name one more time, please? Igubo. Igubo. And, and this is a poem he wrote late in his life called In Sickness, which is perhaps good for the topic that we've just been talking about, mortality. Um, so this is Igubo's poem, In Sickness. The creator's workings are profound and unseen. His form is beyond any description. All that is comes into being on its own. Who, then, is responsible for my illness? Only the sage can view all things impartially, free from the sway of desire. While I am a plaything of the world, I am not master of my own movements, caught in the grip of the creator's hand, thus causing hardship. The four elements are not of my making. From where they come, I cannot say. Like clouds that rise and fall, whence they come, I do not know. Through meditative contemplation, all is empty. Everything, including birth, ageing and death. I am a product of nature, following the path of my own design. Even the damn little creator cannot control the pain of existence. What do we... It, it, now it's, it does seem very Taoist after what we've said today and everything that's gone on. Mm -hmm. This is a, a, a figure, a Korean figure mm -hmm. that you've studied a lot. Can you perhaps tell us a bit about the figure, the poem... Sure. Yeah. Uh, he's, yeah, as you pointed out, uh, he's who I wrote my MA thesis about. Mm. Um, Yi Gubo uh, lived during middle Goryeo dynasty mm. and in roughly 1200s. Um, and yeah, he's seen mostly as a poet. Um, and that was sort of one of his positions uh, in the government at the time was he was kind of the court poet. Mm -hmm. Um, and so my goal and my advisor, former advisor's goal, uh, we were trying to peer into his poems and see, draw out like what we could with, um, uh, Zhuangzi's works, mm -hmm. um, what we can take from these little stories or poems, uh, that could have, you know, some philosophical meaning. And yeah, that's, that's Ikubo. Um, he's... He's a really interesting figure to me uh, because he um, sort of, as and you mentioned it, the Shila had their bone rank system, which is essentially a caste system. Mm, right. um, and but late, this is later. This is Gordio. Times have changed. The political structure, as that, as such, has changed. And he began as a poor person, a, yeah, of little means. Uh, but through his own intelligence and uh, work ethic, perhaps, um, and perhaps uh, his uh, flexibility, he managed to work his way up and become a sort of prime minister, mm. um, which would have been impossible in the yeah previous dynasty. Um, yeah, so he's a super fascinating figure, and he wrote um, prolifically. Um, I mean, like, hundreds of volumes of their poems collections mm -hmm. and um he, he wrote <laughs> once that he uh writing is like a compulsion for him it's like uh it's like a demon like he just feels the need to constantly write um and yeah and ironically he was writing about that so mm. um yeah so but as i said he's mostly seen as a literary figure in korea um i've spoken because I was interested in him um, and am, I've spoken with him about him um, to some Korean people, uh, and most of them at least have heard of him. Mm -hmm. um, maybe they learned about him in school, um, which is um, yeah pretty remarkable because he's just a you know poet in twelve hundreds and mm -hmm. yeah. But anyways, he's he's had kind of a lasting impact on perhaps Korean literature and. Um, yeah, uh, maybe Taoist philosophy, Korean Taoist philosophy. Um, I mean, going <laughs> going to this poem, I, uh, yeah, I mean, it's extremely dense, as you just read. Uh, there's a lot to unpack in this. Um, and one thing uh, that I would like to point out is that uh, at the 
the four elements are not of my making. Mm. Uh, that four elements is a phrase that we uh, get from Buddhism. Um, whereas the Taoists Taoists have five elements, um, mm. but he uses this this phrase, um, and he's he's one of these figures, these kind of um, learned people who were uh, who knew, the, who's a master of the three teachings, mm. such as Chuan of the past. Um, he's one of these kinds of um, figures in Korean history who could who could that that could be said of them. What's the extra fifth element in Taoism? What are the five? Um, I'll put you on the spot here. I yeah, guess, so here, right? fire, water, metal, uh, earth, and wind. I believe. Okay. Yeah. My my son Edward was playing Zelda, mm -hmm. this new um, uh, like the new Zelda and, and Zelda. Not Zelda, but Link, the main character, has to go around and collect all these friends, and they they represent the elements. Mm -hmm. One of the friends represents lightning. One of the friend represents wind, and, and and things like this. So yeah, I'm I'm sure there's probably a lot going on. Mm -hmm. Even the damn little creator. Mm -hmm. Yun, so I bet you can't read that original Chinese, can you? Or can you? Will like what's what's going on? Um, I'm afraid I can't. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's ridiculous. Even the damn little creator. Mm -hmm. He was writing in the 1200s about the damn little creator not mm -hmm. being able to control his existence. Mm -hmm. What's going on there, Will? Yeah, so that's um, that was the kind of main topic of my thesis was trying to unpack this figure, the Zhou Mul, um, in Korean. Uh, yeah, he's it's uh, this figure, the creator. Uh, sometimes it's translated as the maker or. Mm -hmm. I've seen it at more recently as the shaper of things. Um, uh, this figure originated from the Zhuangzi. Um, that was when it was first coined. And um, then um, <laughs> Guoxiang, Guoxiang, uh, Guoxiang uh, his Korean pronunciation. Um, he was the rational the guy editor, that got rid right, of the repetitions. The, yeah. He's the main editor, kind of compiler of the Zhuangzi, main I'm, commentator. I'm ready for my test. Um, I'm good. Yeah, he uh, remarkably um, he wrote about uh, creation, um, but he as he was strongly like anti metaphysical. So he did not take the creator as a serious thing. Mm. And when it was when that phrase came up in the first time in the Zhongzi, um mm -hmm. he he wrote a you know he wrote a comment on that passage, but he didn't he didn't even talk about uh, the creator, and he barely basically barely mentions it in his in his work um whereas um in igubo he mentions uh this figure the creator uh, several times um and yeah it, he has kind of an interesting relationship with it i guess as you could as you can maybe glean from this um poem um yeah, uh, Igubo's creator, um, he sort of uses it as a figure, oftentimes he uses it as a figure of blaming. Mm -hmm. um, like, just kind of, he, he's, as, he's, as he says, it, it's, um, it's not the creator's fault that he feels this pain. Igubo, later in life, had a, I believe he had a skin disease that caused him pain. Mm -hmm. Um as well as he had at least two children of his that uh, passed away early, um, and so and yeah, well, we can go back to, back about this later. But the time that he lived in was very um, turbulent, um, and there's lots of war and death and et cetera going on. Uh, so there's pain all around him. Mongolian invasions, right? Yeah, yeah that's exactly that time, um, and so he's trying to like just grapple with what is the root of this pain um and and yeah i mean in the poem it mentions um the sage only the sage sees everything impartially only the sage can see pain and pleasure as equal mm. um but igubo i believe that he's trying he's trying to be on that path towards seeing that perspective that kind of sagely perspective mm. but um i mean incredibly hard right uh and actually he wrote about like trying to bite his fingers like a fingertip mm. and feel that pain and like he tried to like tried to make him feel like 
um, this pain in his finger, try to make it change his perspective or what have you, like to see that as being a, a pleasurable experience. Um, he failed ultimately. Everyone's um, a Taoist until you get hit on the head. Right. <laughs> so yeah. Pain is real. Yeah. yeah. Um, so he, he wasn't, I don't, I don't think unfortunately he was able to overcome that, um, very natural perspective of seeing pain as pain. Mm. Um, but yeah, so he essentially uses this figure of the creator as um, as just like, as uh, maybe a Christian in a weak moment would say, God, how could you do this? Mm. Like, why would you ha- let this happen? Something like that. Why have you forsaken me? This, right. This is the line of Jesus Christ on the cross. Right. I think yeah. I think I think he's kind of using this figure sometimes in that way. Mm. Um, in another longer work, um, however. Um, I translated it as asking the creator, Moon mm. Um And it's also been translated as questions to the creator. Uh, in that kind of short story, I guess you could call it, uh, the creator is seen as a kind of, as a kind of sagely being mm. uh, in which Igibo asks questions to the creator and then um, tries to understand uh, pleasure and pain and tries to understand life and death and... Um, the creator, yeah, answers these questions uh, for him. And in that story, he's seen as like a, yeah, kind of like a sagely figure, um, as one who knows uh, or understands. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. What what goes on with Taoism having a creator? Because I thought Taoism was the uncarved right. block. Or right. It's not meant to have a beginning because if it has a beginning, it has an end, and it's meant to be everything all at once. Yeah, that's something that I'm still kind of trying to work out because, um, you know, in in Taoism, there's not. I, f- I feel like it would be unfair to say that there's one like creation myth. Hmm. Um, there are kind of there's a, a few like prominent perspectives. Um, actually, and each of them both come from uh, either the uh, the Lao Tzu or the Zhuangzi. Hmm. Um, and yeah, in the Lao Tzu version, uh, kind of the famous line is one becomes two, two becomes three, and three becomes everything. Mm. Um, and obviously that's a super vague way of think, of seeing it. So some people have interpreted the one as being Tao, and then two is the Um Yang, three is, um, oh goodness. Uh, it's escaping me right now. Something else, yeah, and yeah, then yeah. Um, I think maybe three is the uh, combination. It's um yang and um yang, yeah. Uh, and then uh, everything else is uh, created from that kind of combination of uh, plays. Um, Thesis, but, antithesis, synthesis. It's kind of dialectical, yeah. though, isn't it? That's yeah, and it's very the plus the minus. It's a very um, non-theistic way of it's. It's a very non-theistic creation mm. myth. Um, mm. And that there's no there's no one figure, person or deity that makes everything. Mm. Um, it's sort of seen as like a kind of natural, um, yeah, kind of a natural phenomenon. Um, it kind of made itself uh, mm. through these various, um, uh, you know, means. And the other one is from Zhuangzi, and yeah, uh, some some people. So yeah, Zhuangzi was first to coin this term, the creator, um, which is Munjol. Is that? Uh, Zhou Mu. Zhou Mu. Zhou Mu. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so yeah, um, Zhou is uh, making, and then Mu is uh, things. Mulguan um, Mul. Or like it's the same Mul in uh, Dongbul. Okay. Yeah. 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 Right. Same Mul. Um, okay. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. it's. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so some some people have tried to like dismiss uh, the creator as being uh, just kind of a literary metaphor, and it's not meant to be taken seriously. Mm. Uh, Sang, um the editor, of, the primary editor of the text, mm. um, basically just dismisses it. And especially the main time he addresses it is in the preface to the Zhuangzi, and in which he just kind of outright says, "There's no creator," mm. uh, and things just emerge spontaneously and naturally. Um, they self sow themselves, uh, um, and 
yeah, that's his kind of uh, view on that. And so, yeah, so where the creator fits in kind of Taoist uh, creation is still, I'm still working through that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, yeah, Igibo in that Munjo Mu that I mentioned earlier, questions to the creator, asking mm-hmm. the creator, mm-hmm. uh, in that work, um, at the very end of it, the creator says, uh, the questioner asks, um, the cre- I'm sorry. The creator had previously explained that everything came of, of accord of itself. Everything mm. kind of made itself. Um, and Igibo was asking, like, oh, um, when heaven made uh, hemp or linen and people clothed themselves, or when heaven made people and animals mm. and mm. blah, 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 and had this kind of perspective that uh, Chun um, made was the cause of uh, creation. Um, the creator addresses that assumption and says, no, heaven did not make this uh, all, everything and everything came out of the court of itself. And um, then, um, yeah, the creator ends with saying, um, I don't even know why you call me a creator. Have you ever seen me making anything? No. Mm. And... Um, what a petulant little creator. Right. Yeah, yeah, so that's good. Um, I like it. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, even it's, yeah, it's kind of ironic that um, this, this figure, the creator is um, any Yubo mm. is um, he uses this figure a lot in, in his works. Um, and, but at the same time, I, I, I think that, that questions to the creator uh, asking the creator and that, mm. that work is kind of the most, fleshed out instance in which he addresses the creator mm. and these kinds of um, assumptions about creation. And he ends the work with saying that the creator didn't do anything uh, and everything made itself, mm-hmm. um, which is uh, both kind of similar and dissimilar to the Guaxang um, perspective in that Igibo was seemed to be just fine with addressing and using this figure in his own writing. But at the same time, he accepts that, uh, yeah, things made themselves. Um, so it's it's, yeah, it's an interesting little figure um, that I've uh, come across. And and Igibo's works. And recently, I read through um, a work uh, about. <laughs> it's a Chinese name, so I'm gonna. Chu uh, Chuji, um, his Taoist name is Eternal Spring. And it's uh, another, for uh, it's another account of Journey to the West, mm-hmm. and this this figure is a Taoist kind of master lived. They were he was a contemporary with Yu actually, and uh, a few times in this work um, that details his this Taoist master's journey to Genghis Khan, um, and yeah, he mentions uh, the shaper of things. That's how they translate it in that text. Um, a few times, and is yeah. journey to the west going to Mongolia? Is that the west you, uh, going to I Genghis? Because when I hear the word west, I automatically right. think of Paris and Berlin and London. Yeah, not that far west. Yeah, but, obviously. Um, the west means Mongolia. West in this case means I think Genghis Khan was in uh, Afghanistan at the time. Okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> so you know, kind of Middle East. Genghis Khan in Afghanistan would make for an amazing webtoon or something, wouldn't it? I don't yeah. know. I've just never imagined Genghis yeah, Khan. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah, they, they. It was quite an empire at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and Genghis Khan summons this enlightened person uh, mm-hmm. from thousands of miles away mm-hmm. to take this journey. Please asked him repeatedly a few times to please take this journey. Come to me where I am campaigning, Mm. um, warring and, um, teach me about, teach me about the Tao. And especially he wanted to learn about, um, longevity practices or how he can, uh, expand his life, lengthen Mm. his lifetime Mm. or maybe perhaps become an immortal. Um, yeah, so it, it unfolds. And in this, um, this Taoist master, um, I'll just call him Eternal Spring, mm. uh, and Igubo. They both used this figure, the creator, as um, they refer to him as um, playing with things, 
as playing and as um, in this instance, I translated it as a little creator because it, it's a Jo Mul Ah. That last character in that line is uh, Ah, mm-hmm. um, and which kind of means like it's like uh, I think I'm from my yeah from what I understand it's like the same uh, character as you would use with calling. Uh, I guess usually calling a young, maybe a younger female in your family, mm. um, like I don't know, Cheon uh, Ah, Cheon Ah, or something like that. Um, it's kind of seen as like a, um, yeah. It, there's there is that hierarchical element to it, uh, but then also it's like a familiar. It's very you know it's uh, used by very close you know maybe like a grandmother to a granddaughter or something mm. like that. Um, yeah, which is a really weird, um, and that's what he's calling God or the Creator, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, there's this there's this weird element of like, almost like, uh, the Creator is like a puppet master, and he's like playing with his creation, um, and yeah, there there's this kind of like imagery. That's in a few of the references to this to mm. this figure, um, which is yeah pretty interesting. Maybe it's doing that same thing, Yun. So I'm going to ask you a question in a minute, which is, um, if you could ask a, a question to the creator, what would it be? Like, if you could ask, a, <laughs> I know I'm going to put you on the spot. If you could ask a question to God or the creator or the the Jomul, what would it be? This flipping of the Igubo calling the creator like this, um, uh, smaller term like this. Uh, uh, this young thing it's it's very similar to Butcher Ding and it's very similar to the old man becoming the teacher it's very similar to this impermanence of life and death and the man is lower than God or that he's higher than the God and it's always flipping things around this this fluid state and we come back to that idea of what you said that the the yin and yang should not be static mm-hmm. but it should always be fluid and then it kind of makes sense in that way i think i thought of this metaphor while you were speaking about the creator who asked um, did you ever see me make anything and i i thought of this image it came to my mind that when um an apple falls from a tree the tree does not make the apple fall the tree doesn't push the apple down. The, the apple just falls, and the apple falls when it's ready to fall, and it falls at the perfect time. But what made the apple fall? The apple just falls, doesn't it? Like you could go into gravity and science mm-hmm. and things mm-hmm. like this, but maybe it's the same thing. Things just come into being. They come into existence. And Alan Watts always used to say we're not born into... We, we're sort of born out of the world, Like we come out of the world and then we go back into it when we're done. We're not born Mm -hmm. into that metaphor is wrong, but we sort of we come out of it. Then we go back into it. Mm -hmm. We are the apple falling. It's all very mystical. Yeah, yeah. Um, Yeah, mystical and difficult to pin down, yeah. Were there drugs going on at the time? I ask this respectfully, but I mean, there's a lot of work on DMT and I will come to your creative question, (laughs) but now I'm on drugs, Mm -hmm. onto drugs. Mm -hmm. There's the idea of shamanist trips and and DMT Mm -hmm. and uh, mushrooms. You just mentioned hemp a little while ago. Do drugs play a role, psychotropics? Um, Actually, I just recently watched like literally today I watched your episode with David Mason and I, I knew that that topic came up. Okay. Um, and in, in Korea, um, or perhaps in China as well. Hmm. Um, I, I think I disagree a little with, um, what professor Mason said. Just he because, said no. At the yeah. Time. He, he said in, in Korea, yeah. no. Yeah. Um, and he said that that was kind of a unique feature of Korean shamanism was that there was no, psychotropics going on mm-hmm. um but um there has been work done i believe by edward slingerland people can look that up mm-hmm. uh he does mostly work on um chinese taoism and yeah I, he <laughs> i think he uh, is finding a connection between that chinese taoists did use um drugs but especially um uh soul, uh alcohol yeah um, and actually I just read like this, just this semester, um, my advisor, I was in his course and he was talking about Mapoku cause mm-hmm. that's where the school is located. 
And um, he said that that uh, mapo means, uh, the, I guess the Chinese characters means uh, marijuana. Yes. And I've heard this story as well and told it to people and they've said, no. Yeah. So your professor is teaching you that as well. Yeah. Good. And he said that, um, I guess it's part of evidence, for maybe not evidence, but yeah. as just um, an example. Uh, he had this uncle uh, that lived in Mapogu back in the day. Mm. And when it was more, you know, maybe just <laughs> becoming a, you know, kind of, um, it wasn't in its state that it is now. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, the city's rapidly developed, mm. uh, and it was a much more rural area at that time. And um, there was uh, there was natural, you know, uh, yeah, marijuana that you could find in the hills and et cetera in Map in the Mapo area. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said that his uncle would, uh, you know, indulge in, in that. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so at least I mean, yeah. At, Marijuana is not exactly a psychotropic, but um, yeah, I think there's. It, it does sound like stoned sixth form philosophy, though. At a time, do you know what I mean? If you're at uni, what I mean by this, you're at university, uh, not you particularly, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. specifically, but right, you, right, you're right. at university. You smoke some joints, you put on some Bob Marley records, and you're like, "Yeah, man, it's just like we're all the same." And mm -hmm. th there are the elements of it. Yeah, and I think that's yeah. why it appeals to the hippies, but. That doesn't necessarily mean it's wrong, but it, it does that have that element to it. I, I understand that uh, marijuana was made illegal. I think it was seventy six with Park Chung Hee's anti marijuana act. It was nineteen seventy six, and that was because he was angry that his son was addicted to it. Mm. So that was the rumor at the time, and he, mm -hmm. he put lots of people in jail. But people that were here in the sixties, maybe your friend's uncle and things like that, they said that they could put their hands out the window when they're on the bus going to Gangwondo mm. and just grab handfuls mm. of it. And so it was very different Interesting. back then. Yeah, so at least as far as psychotropics, um, I'm not, I, I haven't read Professor Slingerland's work mm. on that. Um, I'm just like vaguely familiar with it. But so yeah, from what I know in China, Korea, maybe Japan also, I don't know if psychotropics played a large role in the formation of this um, kind of, intellectual tradition but mm. uh at least in the case of Igubo, um <laughs> i think he was definitely uh seems to have been an alcoholic uh mm -hmm. he wrote he writes about drinking and alcohol and enjoying a mm. uh, kettle of i mean maybe essentially like makoli like mm. rice wine um pretty much throughout all of his works um so uh, at least you know in terms of uh how do you call that? Substances, uh, mm -hmm. at least alcohol, um, and then you know perhaps marijuana. But I, there's no evidence of that that I'm aware of. But okay. perhaps it exists. Isn't there a Chinese poem about drinking with the moon? Isn't there a famous one about a guy that sits there? I'm sorry to put you on, but I'm sure there's a poem about a guy that drinks with the moon, and that's his friend. Mm -hmm. And yeah, write drunk, edit sober. Mm -hmm. was something that I always heard. So mm -hmm. when you're drunk, just get everything out right. there and then come to it in the morning and go, no, yes, yeah. <laughs> no, right. yes. And, and then you get some good work that way because you lose the ego, you mm -hmm. lose that overthinking. Yeah, and I think that kind of goes back to what we were talking about earlier with the Wu Wei, the kind mm -hmm. of like flow state and freeing yourself of your you know, natural um, societal imprint on you yeah. and just kind of like doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Getting past the un getting to the unthought thought, that mm -hmm. thing that comes uh, once you get rid of the namishis on the public gaze and the opinions mm -hmm. and who you are and that thing down there, you get to that and there's the there's the unmoved. Mm -hmm. um, Yunso, yeah. So not <laughs> Igu Bo's <laughs> questions to the creator, but Yunso, because I heard this in an Alan Watts video, who is some old sixties philosopher who did a lot of work on Zen. And in one of his videos, he says, what would you ask God if you had one question? And what would it be? Um, I gave you too much time to think, yeah. didn't I? <laughs> it would be better if it was just five yeah. seconds. Yeah. For me, I would yeah. ask, like, if all the, is all the thing, like, destined or mm. you just let it happen? Mm. I What I mean by that mm. is, did God program it with codes, like, all the things? with the result and the causes mm -hmm. or he just he or she just created all the thing and let all things happen mm. it's kind of like is there a meaning is there a purpose or is it just yeah mm -hmm. yeah, yeah yeah it's a good question thank you it's a good question <laughs> will mm. what would you ask god 
What would you ask the creator? What would I ask the creator? Yeah. Um, well, I guess thankfully I wouldn't ask the cre- through Yukibo, I wouldn't ask him where did everything come from? Yeah. Because he already addressed that. Um, maybe I would ask him how can how can we see how can we adopt a perspective in which we see pain and pleasure pain and pleasure as as equal or how we can kind of detach ourselves from saying oh this is a good thing I want this and this is a bad thing I want to avoid that mm. and because yeah it's life I mean stuff happens like good and bad is going to come at you and um, how we deal with that is um, is important and mm, mm. Um, yeah maybe I'd ask him about that yeah yeah that's, that's a very good way because it's I, how do you get there how do you let the waves of life wash over you uh, and not react to them yeah and that's why we applaud people like Marcus Aurelius or the Stoics or or these people that do this I've recently uh, discovered the work of a, a guy called Bernardo Castrop who is a, a proponent of the theory of idealism Okay. And idealism, I'm going to butcher this because I'm only just exploring it myself. Um, I want to tell you two stories about this. One is about Carl Jung's book, mm-hmm. Answer to Job, and one is about Bernardo Castrop's view of idealism. In Bernardo Castrop's view of idealism, the whole world, the whole of existence, everything is a mind, is, is consciousness. And we are just diffracted elements of that single consciousness. So the thing that looks out from behind my eyes is the same thing that looks out from behind your eyes. And we we separate ourselves, but actually the world is not physical. The world is not material. The world is, uh, the reality of the world is consciousness. And we're all part of that consciousness, but we've been fractured like a diamond that's been shattered. And that's how he comes at the world. And he believes that all the scientific evidence is pointing towards that that um, he talks about one example where if you shoot these two, um, forgive me, scientists, particles, photons, electrons, I can't remember which one it was, but you shoot them far apart from each other so they're no longer distant. Once you affect this one, it also affects the other one at the same time so that they're connected even though they're physically apart. So mm-hmm. I, I sometimes wonder if we're we're slowly coming back around to the way of wisdom. You know, These people had it in the 4th century BC because ideas come all at a time don't they like there's this um what is it called like the axial age mm-hmm, where you get mm-hmm. plato christianity buddhism taoism they all come at one time yeah and then we go for a long time without anything and i wonder if we're coming back round to those times we're moving in something mm. carl jung's book answer to job which i haven't finished yet because it's blowing my mind and it's too hard and it, the book actually ran away from me for a while and came back the story of Job is God in a game with the devil testing Job. Mm-hmm. Like, I bet I can make this guy mm-hmm. stop believing in you. And he, he kills his children and he gives him diseases. And Job is like, no, I'll still believe in you. But in that book, Carl Jung is suggesting that it's Job's job to make God conscious of himself. Because God is not aware that he's a God. God is just like, yeah, I'm God. I do anything what I want. But it's got not God testing Job, it's Job making God aware, hey, you are God, you're conscious, and to be aware of those things and come. And so we, we read it the wrong way around. That came to my mind when I see a person calling the little cre- the little creator, mm-hmm, creator, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. Yeah, and um, in kind of a similar tradition, there's a, um, I believe he's a psychologist uh, named Ian McGilchrist. Okay, and he's his main kind of thesis is r- related to the two different halves of the brain and how um, they are asymmetrical and how. Um, anyways, I don't want to get into that, but um, he does. He talks about God, his conception of God, and he thinks that God is um, is uh, becoming. God is not just this fixed, um, you know, per- perfect being that just stays the same, and but that God is. Um, yeah, in some ways, like also going through a uh, processual change. Mm. Um, so yeah, that reminded me of that. And if speaking about um, how to handle what life throws at you, yeah, um, there is a really excellent YouTube video um, on 
Um, can I mention the? You can say whatever okay, you want. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. We've already done uh, marijuana. So- soft white underbelly is <laughs> yeah. the channel name. Okay, yeah. Um, and it's this um, man who interviews. Uh, yeah, soft white underbelly. Uh, he interviews people of all different walks of life. So um, he just, yeah, has short, you know, interview chats with prostitutes or drug dealers or homeless people yeah. or, um, you know, mentally challenged people, et cetera. Yeah. And um, just ask them, you know, talk about your life. And, um, you know, usually it relates to like, how did you, how did you, you know, uh, come to be where you are now? And in one of those videos there's a uh he's interviewing a homeless man i believe his name is jeremy and um he the thumbnail is quite striking because uh essentially half of his face is missing Mm -hmm. um and this person uh he was just normal citizen he had a job he was i believe an airplane mechanic and one night he was coming home from work uh taking the bus at the bus stop and all of a sudden, Carl's down its window, shotgun's right there, boom. Oh, no. T- takes a shotgun um, shell right to the face. And it uh, very nearly killed him, and uh, he lost half of his face. And as a result of that, um, he uh, lost his job, and eventually, I believe his wife left him, and then mm. lost his home, and it became homeless. Mm. Um, I, all because of this just random freak you know uh, occurrence like he was not you know affiliated with a gang or something like that it wasn't any you know anything related to his doing he's just going home from work um and the way that he accepts his position um as homeless and not because of any like gambling addiction or alcoholism or something like that like where it's his own you know kind of cause um he just yeah out of a freak accident not an accident, but, you know, incident, he winds up homeless and he accepts, he totally accepts it and is, seems very joyful about it. Um, not about necessarily being homeless, but he's just a joyful person. Um, whereas, I mean, yeah. And I mean, for him, uh, he find, he finds solace with God, but you could easily see the same perspective with the Stoics accepting whatever life throws at you no matter what because it is what it is. Mm. Um, and, yeah, just his attitude uh, related to that um, changed my perspective about, um, you know, gratitude and appreciating what I have and things like that. Um, yeah, and, yeah, I don't know. So I, I – and. But you could easily see other people would be could end up being extremely bitter about that, and that through no fault of their own, this random incident, mm-hmm. now they're homeless, their mm-hmm. wife left them, they lost their job, they're living on the street, um, and you could easily, it could very be very easy to fall into the temptation of being embittered about that kind of a thing. But um, he, yeah, accepts it and seems to be. Uh, I, th- I believe he passed away, but he believed mm-hmm. to be, uh, he seemed to be a joyful person in spite of that, which was really amazing to me. Maybe that's a Job right there. And maybe through Job, he made God get better. <laughs> well, you see what I mean by that? That we, That's our responsibility to, mm-hmm. to live through life and to do that thing and uh, to to improve God. Mm-hmm. That's it, that's very humble and very arrogant at the same time. Yeah, I, I almost think that that's the perfect story uh, with which... To, to bring this to a close, I just want to see if any of you have any like final words or ideas on on Taoism, on life, on on anything like that. Yunso, any any closing thoughts or ideas from today? Mm. It's been a hell of a trip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, for Gen Z, I think the world, especially like people nowadays, mm. are trying so hard to be something or someone or be like someone, but. With Taoism, that's an absurd thing somehow because sometimes we should let things just happen. So, yeah, after this conversation, I think that I should let things happen in my life and do not really think me as a something or someone or trying too hard to be something. Mm. And by doing that, you'll become everything. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's, the, yeah that's the mesmerizing point. 
Mm, because in some way it sounds like just kind of giving up. Oh, I'm not going to try. I'm not going to do anything. But the the message of this is by by sort of not doing, you do everything. Mm. Yeah, uh, very good. Yeah, I, well, I that's like exactly that. a line in the Lao Tzu. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, as to what you just said, um, I think that more and more people are becoming interested in this kind of this kind of a mode of thinking um, or a way to just shift their perspective because. Um, yeah, I mean, the world is, you know, according to the media, it seems to be one tragedy after the next. And so, um, but you can, yeah, you can change your perspective about your own life and about the world and um, you can, you can do that. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's videos on YouTube about ancient Greek philosophy, stoicism that has, you know, there's mil millions of views on YouTube mm -hmm. um, and stoicism is kind of un undergoing its own revival. And there's on YouTube, there's a probably a dozen videos on Taoism that have over a million views, um, which is, you know, this ancient Chinese philosophy mm. that, mm. Um, you know, most people would be like, yeah, who, who cares about that? But um, yeah, if you, yeah, if you take it, I don't know, I want to say take it seriously, but also at the same time, maybe not take it not so seriously. Um, it can, it can change your perspective. Mm. Um, yeah. This might not get a million views on YouTube, Will, but it got two uh, very thankful and grateful listeners right here. So thank you very much, sir. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Thank, thank you. you very much. Cheers.